Okay, so today we are going to talk about a pretty, uh, boy, pretty controversial, kind of sensitive subject. Um, emotional, I guess, was the word that I was grasping for right there. Uh, and and, and it, depression and anxiety. But we're going to talk about causes and solutions. And I, I think it's going to be very interesting to you. I was doing a lot of studying. Oh, I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. <laughs> I'm a certified functional medicine practitioner chiropractor since 1979. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist as well as being a chiropractor. And, and, and one of the things that we're seeing is everybody that comes in here who, and we treat, we've developed a chronic pain practice. I was thinking about it this week. We, we always say we have, we have munched together. I always say munched. <laughs> we have put together functional neurology. We've combined them, functional neurology, brain work, mm -hmm. functional brain work, Functional brain work is, is, is going beyond the symptoms. It's actually looking at the fundamental basics of, of the foundations of what eventually is causing what you're getting diagnosed as. In this particular case, it's like depression and anxiety. So Dr. Gates is gonna talk about that. He's gonna talk about everything. Functional medicine is in general looking at those same foundational issues. Uh, in other words, somebody might come in here with menstrual problems, but we might actually be looking at their stress mechanisms, their gut, their blood mm -hmm. sugar, and that fixes menstrual problems. Okay. I use that because mostly women watch this show and, and I think that might be a good example. Um, th this is, and, and, and we actually, I was thinking about it this week, we actually do functional endocrinology. Mm -hmm. That's really a big part of what we do. Mm -hmm. We actually, and, and, and we actually do functional GI, I mean, immunology. I mean, we have. I mean, the name, systems, yeah, yeah right. name every system. So the point I wanted to make is, is that you know these are multifactorial. There's lots of moving pieces to these conditions, and 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 the, and the medical model for this particular type of work, in which you can't put a finger on the disease, so we call it something like depression or anxiety, is really kind of outdated. <laughs> he didn't know I was going to say that. I did not know. It's really kind of out there. Now, when I'm not being anti-medicine by any by any means, but when you look at, he sent me. Doc, I'm, I'm pointing to our producer. He sent me some. Did you read that about the 17 years it takes for? Yes, sorry, the translation. 17 research. years. So, so, so if the medical profession listened to what we were saying today, <laughs> and wanted to implement it, and right. they wanted to start a program, and 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 maybe a drug or something, which isn't going to fix what we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. It would take them 17 years right. to be able to implement mm -hmm. what we're going to talk to you about today. Thus, an outdated system, okay, from, right. from, that, perspective from that perspective too. Right. And it's an outdated symptom that it, system that it's addressing your symptoms. Well, depression and anxiety are symptoms. You, if you are su suffering from depression and anxiety, can get better. Most always, not always. Right. I said most always, okay. I'm being very I like careful. It. I like it. And we got to read okay. our disclaimer too. Okay. So I have to read my disclaimer, which I wouldn't have read had I not been reminded. First, the disclaimer on depression. But the bottom line I wanted to say is, is depression and anxiety are functional problems. There's actually things that are going wrong with chemistry, with, with brain function and these types of things that are causing you to have these symptoms. And we're going to go through this very thoroughly because every I'm going to do this disclaimer because every mm -hmm. single person who walks in here, whether they have fibromyalgia, peripheral neuropathy, whether they have chronic fatigue, restless leg syndrome, dizziness, vertigo, balance, I mean, I don't care what it is, 98% check off the boxes mm -hmm. of yeah. depression right. or anxiety or both. Mm -hmm. So first, the disclaimer here, because we're going to get into this. And we don't want you at home treating yourselves. Frankly, you're going to find out why you can't treat yourselves. Mm -hmm. Even if you're the internet nerd who comes in here and tells me, oh, yes, I know all this stuff. And you're just going to have to help me with this one piece. You're going to find out why that's going to be difficult for you to do. However, should you decide to try this at home, here's the disclaimer. <laughs> First disclaimer on depression. This broadcast is not meant to treat depression. We are solely discussing underlying factors associated with the disorder and recommend that you talk to your physician or consult about these issues. And consult this, us about these issues. What did I say? Recommend talk to you or your physician. Oh, or consult us about yeah, these right, issues. Right. Okay. So there it is. This is what's got to be done today. We have to say that. Having said that, 
there are solutions. And I love where you're going with this because I, I talk to this about people all the time. So we're going to talk about depressions. We are going to talk about causes and we're going to talk about solutions, real solutions. You need to know a lot of times you may not have to be like this for the rest of your life. In fact, most of the time. Okay. And one of the big things we see when we come in here is people are like, I'm on this thing. I got to do this for the rest of my life. And maybe that's not true. Or maybe you feel, and because when they tell you that, they're saying you are going to be like this for the rest of your life and you have to take this drug for the mm -hmm. rest of your life. Right. Oh, and by the way, you'll probably get worse as time goes on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. It doesn't have to be that way. And, 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 and look, we're talking from experience here. There are things we can't help. This doesn't happen to be one of them. Okay. So I think the first thing that you asked of, Dr. Gates prepared an outline here so we don't miss anything. I think the first thing that you ask is absolutely perfect. What distinguishes being sad from being depressed? Because we do have people that come here just sad, right? And it makes sense because they just lost their husband, exactly. Or, they just did, exactly. or, or, but, but they think they're depressed because somebody's telling them they're depressed and they need a drug. So let's start off with that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we all go through life circumstances, as Dr. Rutherford alluded to. We lose a loved one. We lose an animal. We're going to be down. We're going to have melancholy, as we term it, within you know medical diagnosis for that period of time. That's normal. Where depression becomes abnormal is when you have it for two weeks, and it's really kind of independent of circumstances. So we all have emotions, but it becomes of independent circumstances. of circumstances. And there are other associated features, such as uh, you're losing interest in, in hobbies. You just can't find pleasure in what you used to find pleasure in. And overall, you just, you know, you don't feel good. That's called dysphoria. There are other symptoms that can go along with it as well, including maybe you're starting to lose weight. Maybe you're gaining weight. Maybe you can't sleep. Maybe you're sleeping too much. Maybe you're thinking about harming yourself. And yes, we do have to talk about this today because that's yeah, one of the main absolutely. reasons why we read you the disclaimer. Maybe you have, you're fidgety. Maybe you're, you're really overactive or maybe you just are not moving. It's almost like you're, you're, I don't need to use the technical word, but you're just not moving. They call it psychomotor retardation. So those are other features that have to be assessed when somebody is talking about being sad versus being depressed. And unfortunately, lots of times people are told who are depressed, oh, you're just sad. <laughs> also, the flip side of the coin, and you just need to pull up your bootstraps. And we're here to tell you that if you do have depression, a lot is going on in your body. Yeah, it's not a personality disorder. For, no, it's not. Per se. And, and I, I see, I get where it comes from. We start out with the whole Freud thing and then we go into all, and then we have all these pop psychology things, mm -hmm. and a positive mental attitude. So don't get me wrong, positive mental attitude helps. But if you're left frontal lobe or if your frontal lobe is like not working, which we'll talk about. And, and if you got all kinds of other problems that we're going to talk about gut problems and you got in blood sugar problems and all this is a screwing up your estrogen metabolism and yeah, good luck with positive mental attitude. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and the key to what Dr. Gates said was it doesn't feel like you should be depressed. You're just going like, what is going on here? No matter how I try all those things, you just got done telling me it don't work. Nothing works. The, I, okay, I got depressed when my dog died. Like, like we just, I'm not joking. We just have a gal here who's, who just had to put her, mm -hmm. her, her horse down yesterday. We're in horse country here. Okay. We're in Northern Nevada. This is a horse that this gal has been riding. Oh my God. 25 years. 25 years or something like that has won barrel races with and everything. She is not happy today. Okay. But she's sad. That's going to go away. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. She, that she's not, it's not going to go away today. I can tell you that, but it's going to go away. But when it doesn't go away, even if you've lost a spouse, eventually that's going to go away. It might be years, but eventually it's going that's sad. But depression is different. It's like this overwhelming feeling of like you just can't get out of it. It's not a personality disorder, however, we're going to mm -hmm. talk about that. It is a functional problem. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of better ways to handle it. A lot of people think it's genetics. Right. And I want to hit a few other things too before we get into that. So we talked about independent of circumstances because a lot of people say, oh, my, my circumstances are bad. But what you see within depressed patients is that a lot of patients, they have everything seemingly in the world, but uh -huh. they're still depressed. And so that's where you have to make this diagnosis and you have to say, okay, are they also, are they feeling hopeless? As Dr. Rutherford said, do they have difficulty concentrating? Um, you know, are they, 
not eating, like we talked about before, are they feeling guilty when they shouldn't feel guilty? All those other facets create the diagnosis of depression independent of just being sad, as you were saying. Okay. So genetics. So everybody loves genetics. Especially in today's now day that we age. have the human genome. Decode. Exactly. And everybody is pounded over the head that every condi condition under the sun almost has a genetic component. And if you're depressed, it's just due to your genetics. And while genetics definitely play a factor, and we're going to talk about how you can almost get around your genetics relative to depression in today's broadcast, um, the, de excuse, uh, the genetic factor is not as big as what we once thought it was with depression. So as an example, if Dr. Rutherford was my brother and he had depression, I would only have a 2 to 3% chance of developing depression. That's frankly pretty low. Now, if we were twins, it'd be a different story, but him as a brother, only a two to 3% chance. Whereas with other conditions like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, it's much higher for non-identical twin siblings. So genetics are there and we'll talk about it, but it's not all genetics. It's not all genetics. And, and if it were, and again, we're speaking from experience here. We're not making outrageous claims. We're not saying that every single person that we've ever known who's come in here with depression, we've seen some pretty depressed people. Mm -hmm. And we work with functional mm -hmm. psychiatrists. Right. And we even work with a, 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 hypnotherapist. A, a hypnotherapist who happens to be excellent with these things mm -hmm. um, to get them through the initial part of, of treatment. Uh, but pretty much everybody comes in here with depression and anxiety. It's, it's a rare person that walks out that still has depression and anxiety. Now understand, maybe after this, <laughs> maybe after this presentation, people are going to come in with depression and anxiety here, but almost nobody comes in here for depression and anxiety. They come in here with all the other conditions that I enumerated previously and depression and anxiety are checked off in the box. And then as, as the, their physiology starts to get better, the depression and the anxiety starts to abate. And it's kind of maybe surprising because of what you've already been told. And, and uh, so uh, last week, <laughs> Last week, our computer overheated and, uh, and we were cut off in the middle of this. For those of you who were watching last week, apparently it's starting to overheat again, but our producer is taking extreme measures right now to hopefully make sure that doesn't happen this time. So Dr. Gates just talked about chemical imbalances and, and, and certainly chemical imbalances are a part of this, but then is fixing the chemical imbalance the solution? And right. maybe you can already see where we're going with it. Exactly. So we all know, we've all watched loads of pharmaceutical commercials where they talk about depression. They say, we know, we think with this drug, it increases good chemicals in the brain. You know, you have a chemical imbalance that increases the chemicals in the brain between this brain cell and this brain cell talking. And so that's why you feel better. And that is really the main line treatment for depression in this country. You go to the doctor, you say, I'm depressed. You fulfill the criteria for being depressed and they put you on a medication like Prozac or a medication like Celexa. And so that's not the only solution though. In the literature, everything we're saying comes from the literature. Just so you know, we've attached 20 articles. I, there's a lot of work that went into this broadcast. I can tell you that um, everything is backed up. But what we'll say is that 30% approximately of patients who go in for depression, who take an antidepressant, will have a successful outcome long-term. The other 70% will typically not respond or they'll poorly respond and they'll have to go back to the doctor and either get on another antidepressant, maybe they have to do psychotherapy, maybe all that fails, they have to see a psychiatrist, be put on an antipsychotic, maybe that all fails, they go in for electroconvulsive therapy. That's really kind of the way it goes for the other 70% of people. So we have a lot of people out there who just really are not feeling well and that's why within the chronic pain world when we treat all of these neurological conditions, most patients coming into our practice are depressed and many of them are still on antidepressants. And so within this, we're going to explain really what's going on with depression underneath the antidepressant. So what are the other factors that are causing you to feel depressed that the antidepressant maybe just can't overcome? Yeah. So genetic can be a, a player, but not the cause mm -hmm. and chemical imbalances certainly contribute, but you're, you've just heard 70% are not going to respond to the chemical imbalance. Uh, that is quote unquote corrected by the medication right. and that isn't even really accurate, but yeah, and let's go we, into that, but we can get into that. The, the theory as to why those medications were working is now becoming understood to be incorrect. 
and it actually is working on a part of the brain calming down a part of the brain that we work on all the time without drugs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, is yeah. that something you wanted to talk about now yeah i think we hit it right now this? i think we hit it right now so let's go into it so you take let's say within the framework of what we've pre been presented with depression you as the patient you as the lay public you've been told that you have a chemical imbalance that's why you're depressed so if you take a chemical you should feel better what we know is that a lot of these chemicals that we could go into at length, these medications, they immediately increase brain chemicals in your brain such that your brain cells should start communicating better and you should feel better. However, it takes weeks for someone with depression to feel better. So that has scientists stumped because they would think that immediately people would be feeling better if you got the good neurochemicals up. And what has now been shown is that one thing that antidepressants do is that they grow new nerve cells in the memory area of the brain, which is pretty cool. So growing new nerve cells is a really cool phenomenon. But doc, what is the memory part of the brain? What does that have to, have to do, do with, with my exactly. anxiety and my depression exactly. going away? So what we find is that- I can't remember why I was depressed. <laughs> we also find that in depressed patients, including patients with anxiety, the fear center in the brain enlarges. So it's becoming bigger. We've talked about neuroplasticity a lot in these broadcasts. Look it up. Basically, nerve cells can become stronger. They can grow together. They can wire together. And that can be good and bad. And it can be bad when the fear center starts to enlarge because it's becoming more dominant. Brain's learning fear. So with that fear, once we're in a fearful state in our brain and those pathways are being set off, we send out more fear chemicals, chemicals. into our body, one of which is cortisol. And then the cortisol should come back up to the brain and say, hey, there's lots of cortisol here. The fear response can shut down. But in but you depressed patients, it does not, not shut do down. That. It just keeps going at 9,000 RPMs, like your foot is on the gas pedal. So if you can't go to sleep at night because your brain's going a million miles an hour, and then you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep, we're talking to you. Exactly, exactly. And this is an overwhelming percentage of depressed patients, and we haven't even gotten into anxiety yet. So what they have found is that the memory area of the brain, which is very close to the fear area of the brain, actually shuts off the fear area in our brain. And in depressed patients, this memory area of the brain becomes atrophied. And one of the thoughts is that there's this initial event of anxiety, maybe childhood trauma, maybe you're more predisposed for anxiety, so the fear center enlarges, makes a bunch of cortisol. The cortisol actually shuts down the memory area of the brain. It starts shrinking, and the fear area starts getting bigger. Pretty but cool. The drug makes but the drug bigger. makes your memory area it it nails a little bigger, which so it can shut down your fear area. And you feel better. And how long have we been giving out antidepressant medications in this country? Oh well, they really came to fruition fifties, sixties. They started okay. realizing it, and that's not what they thought they did. <laughs> yeah, just for the record, okay. <laughs> but that's what has to be done to to address at least a part of the vicious cycle and the multi factorial aspects of depression and can be done most of the time without drugs. We know because Dr. Gates does it here with functional neurological, I would say strategies that include mm -hmm. not just exercises, right, right. but you have a number of different, yeah, absolutely. really, if I mention the strategies, they're so simple that you won't believe it. So I won't mention them anyway, because it's not the same strategy for everybody. You have to deal with it. But the point being that stress mechanism has to be calmed down. And it can probably be calm. And I think that's the 30% of the people that get better with those. I would drugs. say probably. Maybe. 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 Yeah. And we're not okay. telling you to go off your medication. But no, what we're no, saying, no. <laughs> what we're saying when is people that come in here. I went yesterday and said, what do I do with all my medication? I just throw them out the window. The, the lady's taking estrogen progesterone. She's got a full hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, no, we tell everybody to stay on their medications until right. it becomes obvious that they don't need them. Then we'll work with your medical doctor to get you off of them. But, but just to get you the idea, that for 50 or 60 years you've been giving a, been given a drug that that works with a theory that it's doing one thing that it's doing it what's the significance of that they we just keep giving it because it worked but we really didn't know how it worked and what other things it might be doing now this is all we know now but 70 percent of you it's not going to work for it and you're going to have to start taking other drugs because it's doing not such good things to your brain okay not anti-medicine not anti-medicine, just maybe maybe utilizing it in in the way it's most appropriate to utilize it, which may not be as uh, pandemic 
as it's used today. In other words, I mean, drugs are used for everything all the time, that type of thing. For these types of cases, um, for a substantial portion of depression patients, ultimately for long-term success, less supplementation, less drugs may be better. At least that's what we see in our patient population. So depression's multifactorial. We've kind of talked about genetics. We've talked a little bit about stress. I mean, let just start checking them off. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, we can and go. What like, you need to know is that this comes from the psychiatry literature. The psychiatrists know this better than anybody because they're treating young. all of these depressed patients who, you know, 30% get better and a lot of them don't. And they keep coming back and, you know, the psychiatrist had to start asking, okay, what else is going on as to why these patients aren't getting better? How can we maybe make the antidepressants work better as an example? And that's where a lot of this came from. So genetics, yes, genetics is a component. I feel that we've addressed that. Life events, yes, life events are associated with depression. Life events can result in sadness, but sometimes life events do tip people into depression as well. Okay, so you said tip. Right. So let me let me just go mm -hmm. a little bit yeah. into this. So why, we talked about, did we talk about concussions? Yeah, Not we yet. talked about concussions a couple weeks ago. Oh yes, a couple weeks so ago. So we talked about concussions a couple weeks ago and got a, a kind of a warm response. And I think one of the biggest things was people started realizing that when you have physiology that's not normal already, maybe you have a predisposition to an autoimmune problem, maybe you already have a thyroid problem, maybe you already have stress mechanisms going, maybe you always have these things going, then there's one thing that can happen, maybe it's that event, maybe it's something that can tip you over past the threshold that you will flow into depression, that the person who does not have those predisposing conditions would have the same event happen and they would get sad and get through it. Does that right. make sense? Exactly. Okay, does that exactly. make sense? This is so important. I mean, mm -hmm. if I'm into this, it's because this is this is like a defining, defining factor as to whether we can help a person or not. Mm -hmm. And if the person can't grasp, if that person's sitting in front of me and they're like, yeah, no, I'm depressed, I'm gonna be depressed, they've told me I'm gonna be depressed, guess what? You're not gonna be a candidate here because most of the time you can be helped. But if you don't think you can be helped and you're not gonna do things we ask you to do, then don't waste your time, don't waste your money, don't waste anything. You know, we're, we, I, I, it's hard to watch, but this is so important for you to understand. There is a predisposition to a lot of things um, and, and, and anxiety and depression happen to be two of them. And a lot of things we're gonna talk about now mm -hmm. could be either uh, a, a cause or it could be a predisposing factor. Right, okay. exactly, exactly. I just wanna say that, now I'm gonna let him talk for all you nerds out ah. <laughs> So childhood trauma is a big one. Childhood trauma is a big it's predisposing huge. factor for depression. And you know, we're gonna keep hammering this train or this, this concept because nobody's really talking about it the way it needs to be talked about. And it's one of the biggest factors in chronic disease and chronic pain in our society, in our opinion, in our clinical experience, and the literature supports it. And so when you have early childhood trauma, the problem becomes that you start making tons of stress chemicals from your brain. Like we talked about with neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity can be good or bad. And you can have negative, or you can have neuroplasticity that has a negative connotation, meaning you have a lot of stress as a kid, your brain learns stress, and those fear pathways in your brain become reinforced. And I'm not the functional neurologist, so I'm generally gonna ask this question, and, and the brain's developing at that point in time. Exactly. As opposed to later on when the brain has stopped developing at what, like 25? Right, yeah, 25. about 25. So right. in childhood, right. when he says it's learning it, it's learning it, and then this chemistry just keeps going, and it never stops, and again, you're the person who's, I was always jittery, I can't sleep, I can't, you know, I can't go to sleep, I can't stay, you know, all that type of stuff. It's huge. Physical, verbal, sexual abuse. Exactly. I mean, we see it like, I, I, I'm exaggerating slightly if I say every day, but we see it a lot. Yeah, exactly. A lot. And it's a player and it's got to go. If it doesn't go, there's no long-term response to the types of treatments that can be done. And then as we discussed before about the memory area in the brain and the fear area in the brain, when there are a lot of stress hormones flooding throughout the system, the memory area of the brain actually atrophies. So that's the link we are trying to show you. So it's like a push-pull relationship. Fear area, memory area. Fear area is going overactive because you've been through childhood trauma. 
Now you're driving stress pathways that fire cortisol, and the cortisol causes atrophy of the memory area. Yeah, I'm no, not saying no, that you no can't insult remember. to the nerds out there, but atrophy, for those of you who don't know what it means, it means that that part of your brain shrinks and it stops working. Exactly. And so that's huge because now the one area of your brain that's associated with shutting off the fear response or one of the main areas, now it doesn't have the potential to do so. So you're going to be more prone for conditions such as anxiety. You're going to be more prone to go through to have depression if you're tipped that direction, possibly by a life event. So that's a big factor. And um, we're not saying that you're going to be stupid because you have childhood trauma. We're not going to say that you're going to have a poor memory. We're not saying that at all. We're just telling you neurophysiologically what can happen. Now, obesity is a big one that's discussed in the literature as well relative to depression. We know that a lot of depressed patients have obesity, and we know that obesity causes fat to grow in the body. And when fat starts growing, it becomes almost an organ unto itself, where it produces a lot of inflammatory chemicals that flood throughout the body. And that can have a host of consequences, one of which is on the brain, and it causes your frontal lobe neurons and area, other areas of your brain just to not work as well. It's kind of like, when you're sick, you don't feel as well. It's common for people when they have a cold or a flu virus to feel kind of depressed. Well, with obesity, it's kind of a similar mechanism with the inflammation going on in the body. And, you know, and if you're, let's say if you're a man and you're obese, that fat adipose tissue will start to do something called aromatizing. That's like a fancy word that means in a man, it changes your testosterone into estrogen when you have too much estrogen as a man, bad things happen. Lots of bad things happen. One of them is poor frontal lobe function mm -hmm. and depression. And vice versa for like females. That. I like it. I love it. That was perfect. And for females, the opposite is true. We all know that hormones can be associated with depression, especially postmenopausal females when they go through the change, so to speak, in life. Then their estrogen and progesterone levels can drop. And a lot of them report that once they get on bioidentical hormones, they feel better, their depression less. Well, the how obesity ties in is that let's say we have a premenopausal female, like not even close to menopause, but let's say she's 30 and she is obese. She's going to take a lot of her estrogen and turn it into testosterone as a probability. And so then that can drop her estrogen levels and that can be associated with depression. So this is just one of the many vicious cycles that I alluded to in the beginning. A vicious cycle is you put on weight. Now your testosterone starts changing into estrogen as a male. Now you start getting depressed and depression. You can't move around. You don't feel like doing anything. You're not motivated. So you put on more weight and you can't lose it. If you're in one of those two situations, if you can't lose weight, you either have an undiagnosed thyroid or you have a blood sugar problem or you have a gut problem or you're stressed or you, or you, or you got a lot of stress. And, and, and a couple of those things will cause this mechanism of testosterone changing into estrogen that affects the brain. Now the brain, you can't do anything. Now you try to lose weight, you can't lose weight. That's called a vicious cycle. And, and depression can be multiple vicious cycles. That's why I said in the beginning that, you know, don't go home and try to do this at home because you have to be able to do a history and an exam to ferret out what patterns are in that particular person. You could have, you could have two people sitting there with the exact same symptoms objectively meaning the same exam findings with the exact same uh symptoms i'm depressed in the morning i you know as the day goes on i get better then i can't get out of bed it could be exactly the same and they could have different cycles they could have different factors mm -hmm. that are applying and you need to figure out which ones is and it can be figured out if you know what's there if you know it's there you can figure it out and then you have to unwind those cycles you have to find a place to intervene in that vicious cycle to start to unwind it and, and get it start. Uh, just a general, get it start getting better again, just general thing, because now we're gonna talk about gut bacteria. Exactly. So I just wanted to put a framework there so that you don't, you're not all over the place with this. Just realize that you have a very complex physiology and many of the things that go wrong down here are causing bad chemistry and bad function up here. Exactly, and so going to the gut, we all have bacteria in our gut. We did a whole broadcast on this. You can go to powerhealthtalk.com, look up, scroll through our pages, through the hangouts. We did one on depression, I think the microbiome, as we termed it. We all have bacteria in our intestines. Bacteria can differ between individuals. We're now finding that bacterial differenti differentiation 
can be incredibly important for a number of human diseases. One is depression, believe it or not. So the bacteria up here can control your mind to a large extent. It's because of the byproducts that they make. So bacteria, they feed themselves. And basically think of the bacteria poop. <laughs> that stuff gets into our bloodstream and it goes to our brain. It can affect the way our frontal lobes, where our positive emotions come from. It's incredibly exciting. So there's this new frontier called psychobiotics, where they're trying to use pre probiotics, but they're calling them psychobiotics because they're trying to figure out which bacterial species to put into our gut to affect how our frontal lobes are functioning. That's kind of a new frontier, so to speak. We work with the microbiome from a different perspective where we basically try to starve the bad guys and kill them off. And we've had a lot of success with that model where we see a lot of patients who feel dramatically better or their chronic fatigue goes away pretty quickly yeah. by changing this environment in their gastrointestinal tract. So that's another piece. But yeah, it's we don't use piece. a lot of probiotics just for the record. <clears throat> yeah. okay. No, we don't. And so there's a, that's another whole subject. We just do probiotics one day. We should, we should You're right. Oh, it's snowing. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's I held snowing. Snowing. I held We're here in northern Nevada, beautiful <laughs> northern Nevada at the foot of Sierras. Lake Tahoe is like 30, 40, 40 minutes from here. Um, and we've been in a drought for four years. And thank, yay, El Nino. Because <laughs> we've got 110% of the snowpack now. Anybody like skiing, this is a place to be right now. Yeah. There's like 15 ski resorts within an hour of here. And just looked outside and it's snowing again. Supposed to be some sort of precipitation for the next 16 days. So beautiful area. We talked about depression and anxiety. We haven't mm -hmm. really hit anxiety. I see the B vitamins. Right. We'll, we'll so talk about that. depression and anxiety are tied together. What we're finding is that anxiety is a major precipitating mechanism for depression. It's rated as like the precipitating factor for about 60% of cases, which is a really large number. We also know that the treatment for anxiety most commonly is using antidepressant medications. So again, we go back to that push-pull relationship in that memory area of the brain and the fear area of the brain. Generally with anxiety, the fear response is overactive. We're going to get into the different types of anxiety disorders. But when that fear area is overactive, it drives stress hormones that then basically cause the memory area to atrophy in that area not to work as well. And for escape of the fear area, so you get this vicious cycle and causing you to have negative emotions and feel depressed. Yeah, so they're very connected. <clears throat> One they're thing I want to also interject, this is the new year and we'll probably do our power health key to success to our patients on this. Because one of the key factors they're finding with depression, aside from everything we've talked about, is a mismatch between goals and outcomes, which is something we've talked about at length that we see with a lot of people. <laughs> You know, it's interesting because you can go through life and you, you, so lots of times we can control our environment. And you know, most when, of the time we can't. I would say most <laughs> of the time until you get into the real world, you can. And then there's a point where you can't. For example, somebody can study really hard and they can get really good grades. But then you can get out and maybe you don't understand why people are not understanding your message or things of that nature. Or why your wife doesn't like you or your husband doesn't like you. There are a lot of exogenous factors that are beyond our control. And so with the new year, a lot of people are making goals. They want to lose so much weight. They want to do this. They want to do that. Then and they when don't. they don't achieve those things, <laughs> that can cause them to have a mismatch in their brain. And in that specifically has been tied to depression yeah. itself. So just be cautious when, sh when setting goals. And so one step back. So we put depression and anxiety together. If a person comes in here and said, I want to be evaluated for anxiety, or they said, I want to be evaluated for depression, it would be the exact same workup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to try again, just to try to bring some focus into this. Similar parts of the brain involved, but just a little bit more emphasis on one part of the brain than the other in functional neurology. That would mean that um, Dr. Gates works with uh, different types of stimulations, different types of exercises, different types of strategies, uh, different types of, of colored glasses and hemifield glasses, which are look like John Lennon glasses with a cut in the middle. There's all kinds of of strategies to affect brain function and uh, so those two people might have different strategies because the, even though they're the same mechanisms of the brain working they're one's over firing the other one's under firing etc cetera, etc cetera. one part of the brain maybe there's a cerebellum involved we, we don't need to get into that maybe we will when you talk about concussion and and so it's very has to be very specific to the person and i think it's one of the reasons 
that we're not seeing things evolve the way I thought we would see. And when I got into this as a patient, I believe it was estimated that there was 45 million chronic pain and chronic condition sufferers in this country. The latest number I heard was just last week from, I believe a government organization, I actually didn't catch who it was, it was on the radio, but they're getting ready to fan out over the country through, uh, through organizations and through hospitals, teaching people how to prevent chronic pain by altering their lifestyle, which will have <clears throat> some effect, okay? It's not gonna cure the problem, but, it, but if somebody comes to your neighborhood and tells you to do it, do it, okay? But uh, um, where was I going with that? I wasn't said, quite sure. Hospitals. What are, I started- Chronic pain, uh-huh. Oh man, I lost my train of thought. See, I need, I need to do my brain. Oh, the brain exercises, talking about how, how it's very specific to different parts of your brain and different, different types of, uh, uh, where was I going with that? I had it so clear. They came out. Okay. Well, now you just saw an outtake. So I'll get back to it. It'll come to me. So anxiety, depression, are two aspects of the same thing. Oh, I started saying that, so we now have 130 million right, people. Right. So the things that, are, that, are, that we're doing out there, we're continuing to do the same thing and it's not working. We're continuing to do the medications, it's not working. Alternatively, we're still using a 5-HTP and we're still using serotonin and, and, and so on and so forth and melatonin for the sleep and all that type of stuff. And for most people, it's not working. The, this is the reason, it's a multifactorial problem. And you have to know what the factors are. You have to be able to line them up in a proper order for that particular patient. And then you have to hit them in a very specific order. And if you do, you can get pretty consistently successful outcomes, but that doesn't fit our model. So when, again, when I go back to saying an outdated medical model, I'm talking that model, probably not making it into the mainstream versus that you come in, we sit with you for eight minutes, we take your symptom, we give you a drug in the alternative world. We give you the paleo diet today and we give you uh, uh, 5 HTP or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I got yeah. there. I used to Beautiful. do that all the time, by the way. Right. Yeah. It's <laughs> rare for that to happen anymore. So yeah. I was a little caught up. My brain's yeah. a lot better than it used to be before this guy <laughs> got here. So hormones. We covered that. Hashimoto's thyroid thyroid's is big. Thyroid is big. So thyroid hypothyroidism is considered a secondary cause of depression. So if you have low thyroid hormone, you will be depressed. What we now see though, is that you can have normal thyroid hormone, hormones and your immune system can be attacking your thyroid, which happens 95% of the time when somebody's on thyroid medication, basically 80 to 95%, let's be cautious. And that immune attack on the thyroid, those immune cells are finding, they can affect your frontal lobe neurons as well and affect this inflammatory process and be associated with depression. So they've gone to big depression clinics and they see that like 32 to 33% of them have autoimmune thyroid disease. Yeah, and if you haven't caught it yet, when frontal lobe neurons, brain cells start not working, one of the things that can happen is you get depressed. Right, that can be tied in with what we're talking about. So it's an inflammatory response. And other areas of the body that create inflammation have to be looked at as well. One of the biggest ones is the gastrointestinal tract. So independent of you having, let's just even say the, the abnormal bacteria in your gut, or let's say independent of the autoimmune attack on the thyroid that can affect the frontal lobes, just pieces of bacteria absorbing into the bloodstream can be highly inflammatory to the body, and that can be associated as a cause of inflammation that we're now also tying in with depression. Next, we move on to concussion, one of our favorite areas. With concussion, we have a head injury, the brain gets jarred around. In essence, certain brain cells start to implode. They start to die. And that can be a big problem, especially if it's in the memory area of your brain or the frontal lobes where positive emotions come from. We did a broadcast on concussion two weeks ago. We attached a study where they showed that after a college football game where guys weren't even getting concussed, they were just They weren't diagnosed with concussion. Mm -hmm. They were just kind of dingy afterwards. The memory area in their brain was already starting to atrophy. Shrink. Yeah, and it was starting to have those effects. The memory part of their brain was starting to shrink. Think about that. Try not to be too overly crazy with, with accentuating what's going on. The reality is when you get a concussion, brain cells die. They're never coming back. When those people come in here with peripheral neuropathy, start having <clears> symptoms <throat> in their feet, you know, I try to avoid telling them that they're 
neurons, their cells down there are dying because it like freaks people out, but that's what's happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's saying they played football. They, they didn't, they were just evaluated. They didn't know that you could get a concussion without being knocked out or anything like that. And not only did they not get a concussion, but the memory part of their brain was shrinking and dying immediately as soon as that happened. Exactly. And they were already able to figure that out after the game. That's pretty, pretty wild. And so depression is one of the major symptoms that goes along with what's termed post-concussion syndrome. So you get a concussion. Some people get a concussion and they're the fine. <laughs> yeah. Some people get a concussion. They're literally fine in about a week, but there's this whole other segment of the population. They get a concussion. We're now finding those who have repetitive sub-concussive hits can fall into this category too, where they develop headaches, they have poor spatial orientation. Yeah. They can't think as quickly as they used to. And lots of times they feel depressed or they have anxiety issues. Okay. So that is depression. Um, I think if antidepressants fail, what are the other mainstream options? Typically, they'll go to psychotherapy. Psychotherapy can be an effective treatment for depression. If all else fails, the next thing in the list of a psychiatrist is electroconvulsive treatment, which has been shown to be effective. They can put electrodes basically on both sides of the brain, the head, or they the way it's doing now, the way it's being done more commonly now is just the right hemisphere of the brain. If you're basically a right-handed individual, they try to go to the non-dominant hemisphere of the brain. They electrically stimulate it, they evoke a seizure, and six-day treatments can be an effective treatment for what we term medically refractory depression. Now, what are the solutions? The solutions are everything other than we... That. Other than that. <laughs> so we're not telling you to get off your antidepressants, but we're saying... 30% of people respond to antidepressants initially. 70% either need another antidepressant or they need another therapy. And we see a lot of patients who come into this clinic who have depression. And 16% of the population at any given instance basically has depression, according to the current statistics. Well, there's our targeted uh, patient group because 95% or more of the people who come in here right. have depression. Have depression. And so what you have to do is you have to assess someone from all those factors. We didn't even talk about B vitamins. My goodness, I tried you? not to. Ah, you tried I'm just to tired of talking about B vitamins. I have so many great research articles. So okay. tie it. Let's go to B vitamins and then we'll go down. You have to understand, I do all the intake interviews here and everybody comes in and goes, I'm taking B vitamins. And I say, you're still pretty sick <laughs> <laughs> because they're just so promoted out there as a cure for everything. And don't get me wrong. We need B vitamins. We need them. But they've been just a teeny bit overhyped as far as resolving serious <laughs> chronic conditions. Would that be accurate? That is accurate because the specificity with which B vitamins are used is poor. So people will think, oh, well, Joe took B12 and his energy got better, or Joe took B12 and his depression got better. So I need to take B12. That may work. There's a good probability it won't work. Yeah. Joe may not be overweight. He may have a good gut. He may not have, you know, he may not have a lot of things going on right. also. Right. Maybe he doesn't have celiac. And maybe, maybe he doesn't have pernicious anemia. Maybe he doesn't have an MTHFR abnormality. Yeah, maybe these, these are all things that would cause your B vitamins right. to not work, right. no matter how many you took, which again is most of our patient population. Yeah. What we find with B vitamins generally, let me give you the skinny, is that an inflammatory byproduct goes up when B vitamin levels are low or your body's ability to process B vitamins is poor. Typically, it's more of the latter that I just said. So the inflammatory byproduct is called homocysteine. We've talked about it in other broadcasts. It's huge relative to memory and concussion. When homocysteine goes up, let me say it this way. In most psychiatric conditions, homocysteine does go up. So it goes up in schizophrenia. It goes up in bipolar disorder. And it's seen to be high in major depressive disorder patients. We're now finding that it's high for different reasons amongst all those groups. For example, in bipolar patients, they don't convert the homocysteine to a really good anti-inflammatory product called glutathione. So they can't do that because generally they lack an enzyme or a effective copy of an enzyme to do that. Whereas with major depression, we're finding that a lot of major depressive patients don't process vitamin B9 or folic acid properly. So they have an MTHFR abnormality. Specifically, you want to look for a C667 allele problem. There are different types of MTHFR problems. 
So the thought process is, is that if we get the right folic acid, the active form of folic acid into the body in somebody with depression, there's a possibility that they will feel better. And the studies have shown that this especially applies to people who have had childhood trauma and who have depression. And there are even other studies showing that it applies to all people with depression, just maybe not the elderly. I'm just giving you the specifics. Nonetheless, it's important. And B vitamins are used to make neurotransmitters in the brain. What we're actually now seeing though is that probably the main thing that happens when these B vitamin levels are off or you can't process B vitamins is that homocysteine goes up and homocysteine damages the memory area of the brain that we've been talking about. That memory area of the brain is so sensitive because it grows new nerve cells. And when the environment is not right, meaning you have lots of inflammation, there's lots of stress hormones, things of that nature, then that memory area of the brain does not thrive and factors such as depression can become prominent. Now within genetics, one other thing I wanna hammer is that a lot of the genetic factors we're seeing with depression even though I said it's only a two to three percent chance of Dr. Rutherford and I were brothers of us having one of us having depression if the other one had it. We can actually now assess what the genetic factors are in a depressed patient. We can say, okay, do you have an MTHFR problem? So you can't make the right B vitamins. Do you not have right copies of enzymes that basically break down neurotransmitters or that produce neurotransmitters? So we can accurately localize that and you can use that information if we work with psychiatrists who use this information to use different antidepressant drugs, or we work with it to say, okay, maybe you need a different vitamin supplementation regime in conjunction with everything else we've talked about. So the solutions are to handle the stress. You have to handle the stress. And our clinic patients are not getting better until the stress is handled. And that's why we work with a psychiatrist who also practices functional medicine. And that's why we refer so many patients for psychotherapy or to the hypnotherapist that we work with. I'm going to stop them right there because people get this when, 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 when patients come in and they're, they've been everywhere. I mean, we've had patients who have been everywhere, not just the Mayo Clinic, but the places in Europe and just, they've been to all their doctors, they've been alternative, they've been here, they're taking the drugs. And, and, uh, uh, and when I start describing this mechanism to them, it, I, I find that using the term stress sometimes is, confusing. The patient will say, well, I don't really feel stressed. But I'll say, when you get anxious or anxiety or depressed, do you feel like you know where it's coming from? They'll say no. And I'll say, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying you're stressed or can't handle stress. I'm saying that these brain abnormalities <clears throat> that Dr. Gates is talking about, you are in a chronic fight flight syndrome where your brain's going 100 miles an hour, sometimes 25 miles an hour. Some, it's going too fast at varying degrees all the time and it's flooding your system with stress hormones and all the cortisol and, and altering a lot of other physiology. That's what Dr. Gates is talking about. And I'm making this emphasis because a lot of people say, well, I've tried to meditate. I've exercised. I walk. This is a different animal. This is a different animal. If you are taking Prozac or Xanax and it works, you are very fortunate. Okay, very fortunate because 70% of the time it doesn't. And there are ways to, to take care of that long term. And this is my maybe, uh, maybe prejudiced opinion because I just work in this office and I just see what's happening here. But functional neurology has come up with very clean ways of doing that that are doable for a lifetime. Sometimes they don't even involve taking drugs or supplements. Most of the time they may involve these, these strategies and or some sort of uh, uh, some sort of maybe a neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters, by the way, are the chemicals that make your, your, physio your brain and your nervous system work. I just want to emphasize that I'm, I'm really struggling with how to present that to people because when people hear stress and Dr. Gates says that stress mechanism has to go, that stress mechanism has to go. It doesn't go. You are the patient who has tried everything. I got, I went, I had my gut fixed and now it's bad again. I went and did the leaky gut program and it's bad again. I got on the paleo diet and it's bad again. I, I, anything that we've talked about here, I took something for my thyroid. It felt good. Now it's bad again. This is always a part of it. People cognite on that when, when mm -hmm. usually when I talked in the beginning, but I don't know. Is that, is no, that's that perfect. And a lot it? of you don't even realize 
So some people with depression realize they have anxiety, but a lot of people don't even realize that this stress response is going on. For example, take a kid who has childhood trauma, they're 16, they're not depressed at that point, they don't really have anxiety at that point, but their basal levels of cortisol and their fight flight response is heightened. And so we can do an exam and we can actually look and see that they have signs of this going on. And that has to be fixed that response has to be fixed, in our opinion, for someone like you to get better. And it's so interesting because the whole way the antidepressants work now, based on our current understanding, is that it's affecting that mechanism. Yeah, we have a gal right now who, and I don't know if you're watching or not, and almost hope you're not, but I feel bad for her. She came in like 99% of her problem is a stress mechanism. Mm -hmm. And she's not wanting to do the program for a variety of different reasons. She just wants to do the chemical part of the program because that's what we know. That's what we're comfortable with. That's we went to the alternative doctor. The alternative doctor gave me supplements in a diet. We went to the allopathic doctor. They gave me drugs. Can I just do that part of the problem? And and uh, there's a frustration for me that I cannot get her to understand that this is the problem, and that she can do all of that from now until doomsday. But until this. Sim- we call it sympathetic dominance. Your sympathetic nervous system, the one that puts you in fight flight, is dominating the rest of your physiology. That's not how it's supposed to be. It's, it's, and, and so that fight flight mechanism, that chronic mechanism that puts out stress hormones, that is a huge, huge reason for most of the chronic pain in this country tonight that will not respond to anything the headache that won't go away, the migraine that won't go away, the dizziness, the vertigo, the balance that won't go away. The person who gets MS who's not going, who, who's doing pretty good versus the person who gets MS who's just going down and down and down and down, and I can go on. And certainly anxiety and depression, it's a huge factor. It's a huge factor. It's, it's, to me, to us, based on our observation, it is one of the two or three key factors that is contributing to chronic pain and chronic conditions. So, so, quickly, what's the other so quickly summarizing <laughs> the solutions, you have to look at, are, is someone obese? Why are they obese? You have to look at the gut. You have to say, what's the bacterial environment like in the gut? You have to look and see, are pieces of bacteria being absorbed, causing inflammation? You have to look at, does the person have an autoimmune problem that's creating inflammation that's affecting their brain? You have to address the stress mechanism. You have to look at the genetics. You have to look at their B vitamin capacity. Do they have high homocysteine? Why do they have high homocysteine? Do you have an MTHFR abnormality? Do you have a COMT abnormality? COMT is a catechol-methyltransferase. It breaks down dopam- dopamine. So you have to look at all these different factors and say, okay, this is why someone's depressed. And then you address it all in an organized fashion, one thing at a time. And we have a certain way of doing that that we found to be consistently successful for chronic conditions. And when you do that, then you eliminate factors It's kind of like plugging holes in a ship that's bringing on water. And then finally you get to the last hole, and I can't tell you how many times we've had this happen, and all of a sudden the person lights up and they're feeling great. One of the best cases was a gal who had medically refractory depression. She had been everywhere, done everything. She hung with us for seven months, which is longer than it typically takes. And finally at the last hour, we figured it out, and her depression lifted, and she's been great now for two years. Yeah, we have a we have signs around our office to say <coughs> we didn't say it was going to be easy. We said it was going to be worth it because it's it's a, the the challenge is in taking the history. We have put together a history that is reflective of our patient population, which is chronic pain, chronic conditions that are multifactorial problems, and within the framework of that history, which is seventeen pages, these questions are answered for virtually every chronic pain and every chronic condition out there. But within the framework of of all of that, certainly the answers to depression and anxiety are in there because almost everybody that comes in here has it. And the same mechanisms that are contributing to that are contributing to why they're in here. So you have to find somebody who does that. It's not easy. Okay. I mean, we do it. Certainly we're open for business. Um, but, but that's the framework that you have to look at and, uh, um, and that's it. That's well, really, and I want to just hit anxiety real quick. Okay. So within anxiety, there are different types of anxiety disorders. There's generalized anxiety disorder where someone just basically feels anxious. Again, we talked about in depression, the emotion is kind of out of balance for the circumstance. So some people, their life is great, but they just feel anxious. They walk into a room and they feel anxious. 
You know, they uh, go to the store, they feel anxious. Now I'm kind of dovetailing into social anxiety. That's where people don't like to be in social settings or their boss says, oh, you got to give a speech today at three o'clock. And you know, it's as though the world is coming to an end. That's what they feel like internally. Then there are simple phobias. So some people, you know, they have a snake in their garage that's a gopher snake. And to them, that's the end of the world. They have a massive fear response to something like that. Others, it's going to give blood and they have needle puncture phobia to where they're really, really concerned about having a needle stuck into their arm. You doing okay there? Yeah, we're pushing the envelope here. Our uh, producer's arm is probably gonna fall off because uh -huh. he's, got a, uh, he's got a fan that he's holding <laughs> over the computer that uh, is frying that's probably gonna shut this thing Just off. Just a few more see. minutes. So with panic disorder is another type of anxiety disorder. Panic attacks, you probably have heard of them. In essence, there's massive activation of that fear center in the brain for no given reason. And what we find is that people really are debil debilitated by this because they go out and they're worried that they're gonna have a panic attack when they go to the grocery store and they feel as though they're dying. This is a major cause as to why people go to the emergency room because they think that they're gonna have a heart attack. And then um, lastly is obsessive compulsive disorder, which is characterized as an anxiety disorder, but it's a little different. With obsessive compulsive disorder, they have these fears, these obsessions, and then they, um, they have their compulsive behaviors that make them feel better. It's not as much an activation of the fear area of the brain, it's more an activation of the area of the brain called the basal ganglia, which you don't need to know. I think we'll wrap it up at that point. I think we might be overrunning the process. <laughs> okay. And uh, we did a whole broadcast on anxiety. You can go yeah. back and watch that. And uh, send us any tips you have or things that you want to hear from us about. Go on powerhealthtalk.com for more information. And um, if you want to become a clinic, you can. if you want to be a patient here at the clinic, go to powerhealthtalk.com. We have a new patient tab there that you can access. And uh, sure. thanks for watching. Okay. See you next week.